Right, fantastic. Sorry for the little panic up here. I put on the wrong lav mic, which just goes to show you need to think things out a little bit before you get up here. Okay, before we get started, I need two volunteers. And the volunteers need to be pretty competitive people. They need to want to win, and they need to understand or be good at Legos. How many of you have experience with Legos? You think you're pretty good? We're going to have a contest. I need two people. Now, come on. We have a whole room of people. You can't tell me that you're not good with Legos. Okay, we have one right here. Do you want it? Come on up. Okay, here we go. So, um, I have two bags here, and they're, they're very similar, okay? They're, they're identical Lego sets. You have a pretty simple instruction with this. We're going to see who can assemble this the fastest. They're, again, they're identical. They're going to be a, it's a truck, and there's like a, here, I'll show you a picture of it. Yep, so there's, there's like this Jeep here, okay? All I want you to worry about is the Jeep. So, you can just skip ahead in the directions and miss this part and don't do the stickers, the okay? Don't do the boat, just do the stickers. Or don't do the stickers, rather. Just assemble the Jeep. Okay, the so. For the box actually they are, okay. they are. However, one of you is at a severe disadvantage, and I don't know which one it is. <laughs> All right, so what I'd like to ask is one of you sit right there, and the other one sit right over there, okay? And whoever gets it done first, just let me know. Bring it up to me. Uh, just right over here, okay. Now I'm gonna introduce myself while, don't start yet, Emily. Don't start. All right, on your mark, get set, go. Now I'm gonna introduce myself while they're working on this, okay? And if you lose pieces, you buy it. <laughs> okay, so I was, there's a, at least one on the floor. <laughs> it's great that I picked Emily. Emily actually works for me at CSI. That was not lined out that way, but uh, she was one that volunteered. So let's begin quickly with an introduction so you know what in the world qualifies me to be up here. And I have no idea what I did with a the clicker. There it is. So we're going to talk about stronger IT controls today. Controls is a word we don't talk about a lot. Controls is not really kind of that fun, sexy topic. But controls are critical. Uh, when I went to Murray State University, I enrolled in the TSM program at Murray State, and I was kind of an odd student because I went to Murray State as an adult. I started at the university when I was 27 years old. And when I went to Murray State, there were almost nobody in that, there was no one in that program other than me who was an adult student. But I did this because I started looking around the world and I tried to pick out what would make a big difference in my future. I had worked at a steel mill prior to that, had gotten laid off, used it as an opportunity to go out and frankly educated myself on IT during that period of time, ran a small business doing computer repairs for a period of time, and then Toward the end of my degree, I started trying to decide where did I want to work. Now, how many of you have heard of CSI? Almost everybody in the area has. So whenever I, whenever I started looking for a job, I thought, where am I going to work in this area? And so I applied at CSI and ended up getting hired on as an internal auditor. Now, there's a lot of you that are educated in IT here, a lot of you that are working in IT. How many of you, when you started learning about IT, when you started deciding you wanted to go that direction, you thought, you know what, when I get out, I want to be an auditor. Not many, but <laughs> maybe one. There's not a whole lot that have done that. So it, it was a bit of an odd route to go, but it was exactly what I wanted to do. Whenever I started learning about this, I realized there's something more to this than IT, something we need to be aware of, that whenever you go into IT, you aren't just an IT worker. You have to have a business head about you. And that was the difference in the TSM program, and that's why I went down this route. Because it allowed me to use both strategic and technical thinking. I never intended to work in technology. I never intended to be the technician. I knew how to do it, but that was not the route I wanted to go. So anyway, fast forward, I end up at CSI. I've been at CSI now 15 years. Again, hired in as an auditor, left for a few years within the company, went to another division of the company, and I did information security consulting for about three years. Frankly, that is my passion. I love cybersecurity. That is the topic that I get really excited about. I, I have on the slide that I'm a cybersecurity evangelist, and there's an, another gentleman in the room once that told me every time he hears me speak, I sound like I'm preaching. It doesn't mean I know the answers. What it means is that I'm passionate about this. 
I know, I know the direction we need to go, but I'm not the technician that's going to solve the problem, okay? So, anyhow, again, fast forward, I get into audit. Let me ask a question. How many of you can describe an auditor to me? Auditor is the one that goes in after the battle and stabs the wounded and the dead. I mean, auditors, frankly, are, are really, they're kind of a tough role because you're going in after the fact and you're pointing out the problems. Another definition I heard of an auditor once is an auditor is, is uh, arguing with an auditor is like wrestling with a pig. When you're done, you're both dirty, but the auditor enjoyed it. <laughs> okay, so uh, let me stop for a minute. When I started at CSI, there was an interesting thing I ran into. There was a guy working there who actually became a professional video game announcer, DJ Wheat. Uh, so he worked out of our Lincoln office for a while, and I thought that was really fascinating that here he was moving on and is really successful in what he's doing. He, he is now an announcer for, um, he's a, a director of production for Twitch and he's an announcer for video games. So, you know, it's kind of an interesting field because there's such a broad area we can go. But again, the one thing you've got to keep in mind is this is not just IT. And if all you're thinking about is IT, you're going to miss a lot of things. Now, again, fast forward down the list, you'll notice a lot of acron or a lot of letters up here, not really acronyms, but I do a lot of work with banks. And why that is relevant to you in here today is because community banking and frankly banking in general is really on the cutting edge of what is happening with IT. If you want to understand where security is going, if you want to understand where IT is going, no matter what field you are working in, go download banking handbooks because they are trying hard to stay ahead of the curve. And they're putting in place a lot of controls. Sometimes they're painful. Sometimes they're not really exactly what you want, but they are good. And they're doing this for a reason because why? We don't want to lose the money. Emily has lost a piece. This race is getting interesting over here. Um, so anyhow, that, that kind of takes me to where I'm at. I, I've went through and I've got a lot of certifications which are up here, but I'm going to tell you all that is is studying for a test. Really, you need to find what you're passionate about with this and do it. If you're already working in the industry, you need to be keeping security on your mind. And that's the route we're going to go today. We're talking about the CIS Top 20. How many of you are familiar with the CIS Top 20? Almost no hands in the rooms, and I just saw one come up. I knew he was. So the CIS Top 20 began several years back as the SANS Top 20, and we'll talk about that history. So we're going to get into what the CIS Top 20 is. We'll also talk about how it was created, because that's an important part of the discussion. And then we will talk about, and we'll give an overview of what the CIS Top 20 is. We're only going to go into six of the Top 20, and we'll talk about why that is when we get there. And then finally, we're going to talk about why you should care about the CIS Top 20 if you're in IT and not in security. How's the Legos coming along? Does she have instructions? She has instructions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. How, how's yours coming along over there? Uh, it's difficult it is difficult, that's right. All right, we're going to give them a few more minutes to finish up. Okay, so what is the CIS Top 20? So the CIS Top 20 is a list of controls that were put together by organizations all over the United States. And frankly, now they're all over the world. People are contributing to this. We'll, t we'll get into how that came together, but it was expert created. And back when it was first created, it was a little bit different than what it is right now. We'll, we'll get into what some of that is. However, this is not just a bunch of government officials that have put together something that we need to do. The CIS Top 20 is put together by practitioners, people who are on the offensive and the defensive side of security and IT so that we can have an adequate control environment in place and know what we need to do to secure our networks. The other thing that makes the CIS Top 20 very interesting is it is a prioritized list. And what do I mean by that? We all have limited time and limited resources, right? You can't spend unlimited money on IT. Unfortunately, IT is not a profit center for most companies. And so we have to figure out where we're going to put our efforts so we get the most result back for those efforts. By going with a prioritized list, it helps you to focus your energies where it matters most. Have you heard of the 80-20 rule? 80% of your efforts will go toward 20% of your results. 
And that is true in almost every situation. It's called the Pareto Principle. It, it works It works in uh, planning how much room you need for uh, organizations. It works for... Uh, it works for processes that you put in place. So this is something that is really out there and proven in a lot of ways. And it certainly works with this. By having a prioritized list of controls that you need to do though, you're gonna spend a lot of effort on the beginning of that prioritized list. However, you get a lot of results out of the beginning of that list. And in fact, when the CIS Top 20 was evaluated by a company in Europe two years ago, maybe three now, this study found that if you implemented the first five controls out of the CIS top 20, that you would rid yourself of 85% of your cyber risk just by implementing five controls. That's pretty powerful. I don't know about you guys, but if I can do five things and reduce my cyber risk by 85%, I'm all over it. Now, unfortunately, it's not quite as easy as that. There's a lot more to it than just those five things, as people who have worked with it will tell you. The other thing that the CIS Top 20 is, is it, it is created by informed people. These are people who are both offensive and defensive in what they are doing. They are working both as attackers, white hat hackers, and they are working on the defensive side. The reason is, if you only work on defense, you have no idea what the other guys are doing. You have no idea how they're attacking you. I can tell you that we have had a multitude of pen penetration testing performed against CSI. And if they don't tell us how they did what they did, we don't always know how they did what they did. We can tell that they may have had success in some area, but we don't know how they had success. So we have to have that, that breakdown with them so they can tell us how they went about it. And so that was one of the caveats of the creation of the CIS Top 20 is that it had to involve, involve both the attackers, the good guy attackers, and the defenders so that they could share that information and get the most out of it. Okay, so what are the goals of the CIS Top 20? The first goal up here is that offense is to inform defense. That's exactly what I've been spending a few minutes on talking about right now. And what I mean by that is that offense is always going to know a little bit more about the attack than defense is. How many of you played sports? You never really know what the attacker is going to do until they do it, right? All you know is you have to be ready for whatever it is that's coming. So that's why you have to be able to go out and watch plays, you have to be able to see what's happening. Well the same thing is happening in the cyber world. Offense is the one that needs to be informing defense of what's going on. And frankly, they need to work together. We're maturing some in what we're doing right now in the cyber world because we're working together in many cases. In fact, sometimes penetration testing is happening where the attackers can actually see what is happening on the defensive side of the network as they're attacking, which is a pretty cool way to go about the test. They can have great success in what they're doing, but it helps expose every single hole in the network when you do it that way. So if it's an application attack that's going on, the attackers are actually watching the errors, they're watching the logs, they're watching everything that's going on as they're attacking so that they can make that attack the most efficient and best attack possible. One thing you have to understand is that in, in the real world, the attackers have unlimited time and unlimited resources. And so when we are working to make our defense, we have to use as much of those resources as we can. Our testing that we do is never unlimited time and unlimited resources. So that's kind of where the CIS Top 20 took this approach that it has to begin with those attackers. Emily is trying really hard to get this done, but she's dropping pieces. Emily, it looks like you may be about to lose over here, frankly. Are you serious? Yeah, get going. <laughs> okay. Oh, whoop, didn't mean to go ahead. So the next step on this was focused on return. I mentioned this a minute ago. When you work in IT, unless you are an IT service provider, IT does not bring back revenue. There's no profit in IT. It's not a profit center in any way. It is a cost. So you have to be sure you understand how you are providing results for the organization. Well, 
within the CIS Top 20, it helps you to focus your efforts where you are going to get the maxim maximum return on those efforts. That goes back to this prioritized list that we're talking about. By following the prioritized list, you can demonstrate that you're providing the most bang for your buck whenever you're putting this together. The next step is critical, and this was one of the founding tenets of this, is that it has to be able to be something that is automated. The problem when it's not automated is that you drop the ball. You don't necessarily know how to keep your eyes on every single piece that is out there. And so when you set up an automated system, an automated system that goes through as many of these controls as possible, it takes the human factor out of it. Now, how many of you, are you done? All right, let's see it. Okay, so Emily's created. How are you doing over there? Well, I've got a steering wheel inside this uh, desk. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name, by the way? Caleb. Caleb. Okay, Caleb, thank you for being my guinea pig over here. If you don't mind, put it back in the box for me. <laughs> Emily, congratulations on winning. But Emily had a really unfair advantage, and there's a point to this. Emily had something in her box that Caleb did not have in his box. Emily had an instruction book. And so did I when I tried it out. Okay. So, <laughs> but Emily had, an, Emily had an instruction book. Caleb did not. The point in this is Caleb is over here. He has a picture to look at, and he's trying really hard to put this together by this picture. And going by his comment he made a minute ago, he's trying to reverse engineer how this is. How far along did you get, Caleb? All right, so you're probably 70% done. We're not even sure if it's right, though. That's the problem. We know it looks good. We know it looks good, but we're not, we're not quite sure it works. Have you heard about the, uh, the IT worker that he told GM, or, or told uh, General Motors, rather, that if, if the cars in America were designed like IT works in America, we would have 32 volt engines that get 100 miles to the gallon and cost $10 to buy the car. And the GM worker looked back at him and said, that's absolutely right, and yet you'd have four crashes a day. And that's true, right? <laughs> and so anyway, the, the point of this though, let's get back to this. The point is that Emily followed a very precise set of instructions. And those instructions allowed Emily, who has some knowledge in Legos, admittedly, she's probably played with Legos when she was a child, but it allowed her to take that and put together this Lego set faster than Caleb was able to, who Caleb also, I think, is a smart individual, has probably played with his, set of, his share of Legos over the year, years, and Caleb could have accomplished this if we had given him enough time. He could have finished what he was doing, but we don't know for sure if it would have been right. We don't know for sure if it would have worked. We have a steering wheel loose in the Lego set over here, and it could have taken him significantly longer to get to results. That's the point of the CIS Top 20. It helps you get to results faster. Everyone that works in IT is smart. Every single person that does it is smart. You cannot work in IT without having a lot of knowledge. However, you are not foolproof. And you do make mistakes. And you do prioritize things based upon your biases rather than based upon fact. And so oftentimes in IT, we're focusing our energy not on the prioritized return that gives us that return on our investment, but we're focusing it where we think it should be focused, which may or may not be right. Now, if Caleb had had a team of five other people over here, he may have put that together faster, perhaps. But without the instructions, he would have probably never beat Emily who was working with instructions. Okay, so the point I was at a moment ago when, when Emily finished is that automation is, is critical in this because it reduces the number of human errors. When you are relying on a human being, you are always going to have errors. In fact, I can tell you in my own history, and it hasn't been that long ago, I had a computer problem with my computer at home. I could not get something to work on it. I needed this to work. I was panicking. I was wrestling with it. I have worked with computers for most of my life, and I work on computers still regularly. How could I not figure this out? I looked over everything over and over and over. Do you know what was wrong? 
the cable was not plugged in where it needed to be plugged in. That's exactly right. No matter how smart you are, you miss the simple mistakes. And that's why automation provides you great value. Now, the next item is consensus. And where this comes in is we all, as smart individuals, with our own resources, our own background, our own experiences, come to different conclusions on what the most important thing is for us to focus on. But if we work by consensus with these large groups of experts, people who are out in the field seeing this every day, if you have to come to consensus, you eventually boil to the top the things that are most important. And that is where the CIS Top 20 began this mission that we have to have people who are experiencing this and they have to come to some degree of consensus before this is published. Okay, so let's talk about the history of the CIS Top 20. So it really begins a lot longer back than most people realize. So it wasn't called the CIS Top 20 at this point. It wasn't called the SANS Top 20. But if you go back to the very beginnings of it, which were around the year 2001, the SANS organization was working with the FBI. And they were trying to figure out, how do we stop this hacking problem? What do we do about this? Let me tell you, it was a whole different world back in 2001. If you think there's a hacking problem in 2001, you would be stunned with what we're facing today. And so back in 2001, they wanted to stop this problem. And so they got together, SANS and the FBI originally, that was the only two involved, and they began putting together a list of controls, a list of things that you could do on computers that would make those computers more secure. Now, what were those things? Disabling ports. Make it where you can't remote into a computer from the Internet. It was things like this. this. This is basic things, blocking and tackling. But yet, the great minds that make our operating systems, at least at that point in time, felt like having convenience was better than having security. And so the security experts were having to figure out how do we fix this problem? And so they were implementing these controls, and that's where this was born. That was the brainchild, this configuration list. And oddly enough, it began with 20. That has nothing to do with where we're at today, but that is where it began. So we fast forward about four years to 2005, and so the world has become a lot more complex by 2005. If you have worked in IT between the years 2000 and 2005, things changed at such a rapid pace that you could hardly keep your hands on what was going on. Things are still changing, but there was so much conceptual change in those five years that you wouldn't recognize the beginning from the end at that point. And so what happened? These groups and some others grew this list by 10 times and they came up with these 200 different configuration changes that needed to be put in place to make this work as well as it needed to work. So we move forward just one more year. The world is moving really fast at this point. It's hard for people to keep their hands on what's going on. And so in 2006, the update that was put out then doubled another 200. So they're now at 400 plus configuration changes. And somewhere along the line, people started thinking this might not be the best way to do this. To have this list of things that we have to fix all the time. Because all you're doing at that point when you're fixing that list of items is you're working yourself to death to try to stop every little niggly thing that's going on. And if you're in IT, you don't have time for that. So, Somewhere around 2008, early in the year, the U.S. government is getting very interested in this topic, and they're trying to decide, what do we do to fix this? And so the U.S. government brought in a guy named Tom Donahue, and Tom Donahue was uh, one of the integral parts of developing this in the beginning. Tom made the statement that part of his mission at that point was to put into place a prioritized list of controls that would help strengthen our network. However, nothing could go on that list that did not have a direct impact in either stopping or detecting an attack. If there was not a direct impact, it couldn't be out there. Now I'll tell you from an audit world, we love to point out the theoretical, but this is not theoretical. 
This is real world examples of things that have an impact on the end. So that's the mission they went into this with. Now part of the mission was also that they were involving the attackers. So this team expanded and you had folks like Mandiant who were brought into it. You had other big organizations that were brought in. White hat hackers, people who were red teaming, people who were blue teaming. You had the best defensive folks in the world on these teams. You had the government involved from the Department of Defense. You have the government involved from the FBI. You had NSA who was one of the founding people involved with this. You had every major organization that had a stake in security who wanted to be a part of this. And there was a lot of challenges that came with this. We've talked a number of times already about offense informs defense. Well, guess what? The NSA didn't think that was a good idea at that point in time, and there was good reason for it. Because the NSA was partially in an offensive mode against United States enemies. And so they didn't want to disclose all these offensive things they were doing, the, the attacks that they were doing. But the government at that point said, we have got to do something different because we as a country are not secure. So how are we going to solve this problem? And so that's when they put this mandate out. And so this came in under uh, George H. W. Bush's, uh, George W. Bush's rather, administration. But this was, this, this is not really a president's job. This ended up being cross-administration as they developed it. And so in 2008, we have the birth of the SANS Top 20. For those of you who have been in the industry for a long time, the SANS Top 20 is what we called this in the beginning. When it came out, this was this great tool, the SANS Top 20. And SANS was one of those organizations that was driving this. They were not the publisher of it. They just happened to get slapped their name on it. So there was a government organization that was behind it at that point. And they did something a little different at that point. They went away from configuration changes. And that's key. At that point, they decided, we're going to look at categories, we're going to look at cooperation, and we're going to look at prioritization. And at that point, everything began to change. So they published this list, which admittedly had its own flaws and has grown over the years. Now, we get to 2013, and the Council for Cybersecurity, or Council on Cybersecurity, takes over the SANS Top 20 at that point. They're trying to find a permanent home for this, a place where it belongs, and so they ended up calling it the CCS Top 20 at that point. Some changes were happening around that time. It still had not had a lot of advancement, but between 2013 and 2015, a lot of things happened. So the Center for Internet Security took over the, the SANS Top 20 or the CCS Top 20 at that point, and then we get where we're at today with the CIS Top 20. The Center for Internet Security is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to providing a more secure internet. They do this through a number of means. The CIS Top 20 is just one of those things. So they get this, uh, take this over, and now we move forward to 2019, and they've published the newest version of this, 7.1. If you are familiar with the SANS Top 20 or the CIS Top 20, and you have not downloaded a copy of this this year, go get a new copy. It is different. And so they've made a lot of really good progress on this. We're at version 7.1 right now. And so I want to talk a little bit about the changes, changes that are going to make some of you very happy because if you're in IT, I guarantee you, you have said, I can't do everything in this book. It will break my organization. Have you ever thought that? If we try to implement everything in this book, we're going to be in trouble. Well, so what they did, this time they put levels in place. And for those of you who haven't looked at this, you need to because it changes how this goes about. So early in in the book, you'll find that they've defined three levels. And I'm skipping up. There it is. So they've defined three color-coded levels, okay? Right here. This is key to what you're doing. So as an IT worker, if you are working in a very small business, do you need to do everything the multinational company that is securing the most critical data in the world does? Maybe you need to, but you can't. You can't, it's, it's not profitable. So they, by color coding, what they have done is they have said, if an item is green, everyone needs to do it. If an item is orange, 
Companies that have more risk, larger companies that have confidential data that they really need to protect need to do it. And then if we get to the final category, the blue, that is the companies that are protecting the most sensitive data out there. So it helps you to find out exactly where you need to be in this mix. And as you move forward to the controls, and you'll need the PDF and the, the Excel version of this. By the way, it's free. Go download a copy. You really need to look at this. If you were in IT and you don't have a copy of this, you're missing out. Go register and download it. Once you get to the controls, you'll find that the controls have the color coding over here. And it tells you exactly where you need to spend your time depending on the risk of your organization. That's fantastic if you have an uh, enterprise grade firewall, router, intrusion protection, uh, protection system, intrusion, I'm sorry, intrusion prevention system, intrusion detection system. That's all fantastic, isn't it? But if you're a home-based business, you can't do that. But you can do the right things because we all have risk. So that is critical to this. Again, if you haven't looked at it in a while, you're missing out on some of these critical changes that have come through with this. So that takes us to where we're at today. So what are the basic controls? These are the controls that everybody needs to be paying attention to. Number one, inventory and control of hardware. Now I'm not going to go through every single step of this, but I'll tell you a little secret. If you do not know what you have, you cannot protect it. I can tell you from a lot of experience, very few organizations know every device on their network. And I can tell you from some scary experience that there are banks that I have personally visited when I was doing information security consulting that had computers on their network that had been theirs, fell off the books, and they did not even know they were there. These computers aren't being updated. They aren't having antivirus put on them. They're not being protected in any way, and they're sitting there riding on that network. So the beginning thing we need to do is a good inventory. And so where does that inventory, where does it begin? There's a lot of technical tools you can do this with, but it begins with purchasing. What have you bought? And if you bought it, it needs to be in your list, and you need to be maintaining a list. Who owns that? When does it fall off your system? What operating system is it running? What name is on it? You need all this information about your hardware so you know exactly what you have to protect. And this moves further down the list. As you get more advanced, you should be able to reconcile that through automated tools that go out and check your network and know what is plugging into your network so that you always know what is out there. Now, the next one is just as important. There was a guy that worked for me a few years ago. He had a statement that, that I think has been incredibly profound. I did not realize it at the time. But he said, every single computer that we use today is a server. They're all running software that allows them to communicate and things to communicate with them. It's not like it once was. It's not just a one-way road. So we're having this constant communication. And if you haven't locked that down, you have a lot of risk. And the software that you're using is playing a role in that risk. If I were to ask you to pull your cell phones out and take a moment to count every application on your phone, most of you would have over 100 applications on your cell phone. And if I then ask you to tell me how many you were using, most of you are using five to seven. And so you have an incredible amount of risk that is there on your cell phones, and this is the same within our organizations. Do you have software that is communicating with servers on the internet that you aren't monitoring? So you have to have that same control with your software that you have with your hardware. And as you advance and as you have more risk, you need to be automating that process so you know at any given point in time what is on your network, and if it doesn't belong, if it's not whitelisted, then it is removed. The next steps, vulnerability assessment and remediation. When I first began in this industry, it was adequate to run an annual penetration test. That was a big deal. Run that annual test, point out your vulnerabilities, and next year we'll do it one more time. Vulnerabilities are growing at an incredible rate. There was one study by a security uh, software manufacturer that found that there were an average of 283 attacks New, new types of attacks beginning 
every second. That is crazy. And so if we're not out finding what those vulnerabilities are consistently, if you effectively don't have a continual vulnerability scanning program, you don't know what you don't know. So you have to do this to, to understand what's going on. Next is controlled use of, of, of administrative privileges. This is a hard one to break. If you've been in IT a long time, you want your admin rights because you're in IT. But we need to control those rights. We need to get back to a point where you only have access to what you need access to, and that is it. If you don't need access to a server, you don't have access to the server. If you don't need access to an admin account, you don't have access to an admin account. One of the things we've done at CSI, we've locked down those accounts on almost all workstations where you can't even install software on your own because you don't need that ability. Yes, it's an inconvenience but it's also a huge risk. The next one, secure configurations. Quick raise of hands, how many of you work in IT right now? When you have a computer come in that's got a serious problem, that's a bad day and it's a lot of work. But if you have secure configurations already built that are not sitting on your network, you can rebuild that machine with an image really quickly and you know it's already secure. So we need to be beginning with that secure configuration, secure images, so we always know we're running the best of what we need, something that's already been approved. And then finally, audit logs. This is another humorous topic for me. Years ago, we, we were looking to see all these organizations had that they were logging all this data. And it never occurred to any of them that there's something you might actually need to do with those logs. And so we had one organization that was logging everything but they never looked at a single log. So they had no idea what was going on. Now the world's changed a lot. Things are a lot better. You can actually now integrate your logs. You can find anomalies through tools that are out there. But if you aren't looking at what is going on with your logs, you are missing out. This is the way that we stop attacks. Now this is only six of the 20, but these six are considered the basic controls. If we go back to the book again, and again, if you don't have this, get it. I'm going to say that over and over. But in the very beginning of the book, it defines what you need to do. The six we've covered are considered basic. Every organization needs to be implementing these. If you haven't, you're not out of grade school yet. Okay? Next, we have the foundational controls. These are the controls that are equivalent of being in high school. Okay? You've got a good knowledge base. You're doing the right thing. But if you're more advanced then you need to be over here using these organizational controls. So again, we've only gone over the first six, but those six are critical for us to understand. So why do we do this? We're going to wrap up here in just, just a few minutes. Number one is wisdom. We are using the wisdom of the masses to help us understand how to better control our IT infrastructure. You're using the wisdom of people who have been doing this a long time. If you've only been in the industry a few years, you don't have the same knowledge as somebody that's been doing it 20. And so we're getting that benefit. Second, we're getting knowledge. That knowledge is knowledge about our own systems, our own processes, our own software, our own hardware, a better understanding of what is going on. Third, prioritization. The prioritization, again, I'm, I'm just emphasizing this a lot, but it helps us put our energy where we need to be putting it. Fourth, it gives you a roadmap. Any of you who work in a corporation, if you can't walk into your director, your VP, your president, your CEO, and show them exactly how you're making progress, you will not get the budget you need to do your work. And this roadmap helps you prove to them that you're adding value. It helps you show exactly where you're at in the process. And then finally, risk. The risk is not going away, folks. You are in an industry that is secure forever because there's always risk here and it's growing day by day. And so that is all the more reason for us to get our hands around this quickly. If you're interested at all in what's going on in the cyber world and you're on Twitter, I encourage you to check out my Twitter handle. It's nothing that I have written. I'm going out curating this from the experts so you're getting it from the people who really know what's going on, not me. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.